The human voice. We all have a voice. And it's what we communicate with. Now, you may send a lot of emails in the day. You may send a lot of text in the day. But sooner or later, you're going to have to interface with an actual human being and speak words with them. Anybody here who never has to interface in their whole day with another human being from the time they get up till the time, time they go to bed. Anybody? No. You all have to do it. Right. I'm going to give you some facts. Most people talk too fast. Anybody here actually aware that they talk too fast? A lot of nodding heads. They are nervous. And they want to get it over. All that does is make the recipient or recipients think you're nervous. Because people who talk too fast, it's automatically, subconsciously accepted by the other party that you're nervous. Because if, if, if you're trying to get it very, very far, and I just, just want to get the same, and I want to get the hell out of my blah, 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 blah. This guy is nervous. I can't. What can't I do if he's nervous? What can't I do if he's nervous? You can't trust him. So, people don't trust you if they think you're nervous. If you talk too fast, they think you're nervous. And the other thing that people do is they talk. Oh, that should have had another O. I told you I was dyslectic. They talk too quietly. Usually, you are snatched untimely from your mother's womb and some doctor slaps you on the arse and makes you cry. They want to check that, you know, you can make a sound. Yeah? That's what happens. Oh, another baby. Oh. Right, another baby. Oh. Another baby. Oh. That's what they do. That's your first sound you make. The sound you make is ah, which is actually ah. The most basic sound, which we shall come back to, is, it, it may be Hollywood, if it is, tell them I'm busy. Um, the, ba the basic sound is ah. Allah. Ah. How are you? It's a very important sound. We'll come back to that in a minute. But the baby makes a sound and from then on goes on making sounds till it can talk. And then once it can talk, it never stops talking for the next 40, 50, 60, 90 years. But the voice you hear from the moment you're born is in your head. You do not hear your voice as others outside you hear it. But you can't just trust someone by their history, by their CV. You have to trust them. Why do people talk quietly, too quietly? I'm going to tell you why people talk too quietly. Because they hear their voice in their head probably can't read that. The reason people talk too, too, too uh, um, quietly is because it sounds okay in their head. And you start to talk to someone who's outside in another room. Uh, how are you doing? Um, Fred, can you hear me okay? Sorry, Fred. What's the problem, Fred? Fred can't hear you. You've got the door closed. You go and open the door and say, Fred, can you hear me? Sure, I can hear you fine. You've got the door open now. Talking too quietly is because you've got the door closed, and you're not letting it out. You've got to open the door, forget what you're hearing in here, and project it. And in a minute or two, we're going to start talking about how you can project your voice. When you think you are talking too loudly, believe me, you're talking just right. When you think you're talking too slowly, believe me, you're talking just right. Because most people talk too fast and too quietly. What do we think 
when someone's talking to us, they have a little tiny voice. Okay, so we've talked about speaking too fast and speaking too slowly, right? Now, let's see the next thing. How does the voice work? So it comes down like that, and it goes out, and it goes in, it goes around, and it's, it's a bit like that, isn't it? Sort of Picasso violin, okay? How many strings? Six, is it? Huh? Four strings. Oh, four strings. Right. One, two, three, four. And then we've got the little, what do you call those things that you can tighten and loosen at the top? Pegs. Thank you, sir. Now, I believe that this is called the neck. This is called the neck of the violin. And I believe that this is called the body. Is that correct? And I believe that this is even called the waist. Is that correct? Okay. Now, what happens when you bow it, the strings vibrate. Is that right? When I bow it, the strings vibrate. Now, the sound falls into the body which amplifies it, because that's a resonating cavity, and it amplifies it, and hopefully it comes out as a couple of semi-quavers, beautiful note, beautiful sound. But that's what we do. Only we don't bow our vocal cords, we take in air, and we use the air to vibrate the vocal cords, which are the same as these strings, and out comes, we hope, a beautiful sound. Isn't that amazing? We are like a violin. Just wanted you to see that you are actually, if you can think about it, you're like a musical instrument. You therefore owe it to yourself and other people to make a beautiful sound. Not a little tiny quiet sound. Not talking too fast so you can't understand what you're saying. Another reason that people talk too fast and want to get to the end of the sentence is because they're running out of breath or afraid they're running out of breath. Isn't that true? Okay. Now, the most important thing in the human voice is what powers it. What powers it is breath. Unlike bowing the fiddle, the violin, we get the sound powered by our breath. We take the breath in, we store it in our lungs, and we control how it comes out so that we get to the end of the sentence. And one of the most important things, once you've mastered how to get enough air in and control the voice, is not to drop off at the end of the sentence. Because when somebody says, Oh, hello, how are you today? Uh, how are you doing? Oh, have you got another thing? That I want? People drop off at the end of the sentence. It must be hell being a waiter in Britain because the British drop off at the end. Waiter, could I have another bottle of Chateau? And so I said, what was it? I just told you I want another bottle of Chateau. Oh. We drop off at the end of the sentence. It's very annoying. It's very depressing. It's very depressing when people drop off. So either you say, hello, Valentine, how are you doing today? Oh, not very well. Hello, Valentine, how are you doing today? Hello, everybody, how are you? It's great to be here at HSBC. Not it's great to be here at HSBC. I'd rather be at Morgan... No, 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 no. You know, <laughs> you're getting faster now. Now we've been going for half an hour. Yeah, seriously. See what I mean? Don't drop off at the end of the sentence. The only way you can ensure you don't drop off the sentence is two ways. One is to take enough breath in and control how it comes out, which takes a bit of time to learn... I train people in the city and all over the world to do this, and the first thing we spend days and weeks doing is learning how to get enough breath in and control how it comes out. So we have command, and when we have command, vocal command, we engender trust, empathy, all the things we mentioned when we started this evening. Yeah? Okay. Right. Now, we've got to get enough breath in. Most people were taught, and tell me whether you were taught this, my mum always said to me, I had to breathe in through my nose. If I opened my mouth, I'd get flies in it and 
diseases and things. Did you get all that as a kid? You know, don't, don't breathe through your mouth. You get stuff in. But you see, you can't get enough air in. I'm about to demonstrate, and I'm only going to do um, two bars, because otherwise you've got to pay. Now, I started off as an opera singer, and then had many years in concert, and then um, on the West End uh, stage in musicals and in television. And I learned very early on uh, that I had to breathe in through the mouth. My singing teachers, who were Italian, and it was very lucky they were, taught me I had to get enough air in. Now, for instance, if I breathe in through my nose, just suppose, you won't see the late, great Pavarotti or any opera star or any singer breathing in through their nose. You won't even see Mick Jagger breathe in through his nose because you can't get enough air in to sing. I'm going to sing you a couple of bars from the most famous aria from the most famous opera. Your tiny hand is frozen from La Boheme. Right. I'm going to breathe through my nose. Your tiny hand is frozen. Let me warm it into life. That's as much as I can do, guys. I'm going to breathe through my mouth. Your tiny hand is frozen. Let me warm it into life. You can clap now if you want. Okay. Singing is so important for the voice. People have been coming to me for about 14 or 15 years and lots of business people say to me, I can't sing. And then I say, did you ever sing? And we trace it back and always between the age of seven and nine, something happened. The teacher said, oh, Jimmy, you can't be in the choir. Your voice is not good enough. Or the elder brother said, oh, shut up. Don't, don't sing. It sounds like cats dying. And, some, and then there's a block. Yeah? And then they don't sing again. The shutters come down. That is, singing is a joyous thing. It's wonderful. How many people here sing in the bathroom or the shower? I do a lot of work with people uh, around the world in about 10 different countries who want to improve the way they speak English. You see, what happens with a lot of people they learn English at school, or with a tutor, or whatever it is, they go on a course. Now, for many people, they are taught English by someone who isn't English. So, for instance, um, I find if I go to the Middle East, I hear Egyptian English, or Arabic English. I go to Africa, they're speaking Arab English. And people are doing their best, because they've learned English, but not from someone who can tell them how to sound English. And what I do is I run courses for people uh, to learn to sound really English in a very short space of time. Because the trick is you've got to know some of the basic English sounds. Here's some basic English sounds. Tell me if everyone can see. R, A, E, O, U. I do not use the phonetic alphabet because it's very complex, and people will have to learn it. R-A-E-O-U, basic sounds. Of course, there are lots of other basic sounds. There's probably only about 15 sounds I have to deal with in helping people with their English. But it doesn't just help people whose first language isn't English. It helps people whose first language is English. Because what we tend to do, particularly in Britain and America, we tend to squeeze the words, or stretch the words. When you go, you know, maybe to the north of England, they take the vowel sounds and they stretch. Valentine, how are you doing today? It all gets stretched right out, doesn't it? You know, and some people kind of uh, do strange things and put it up in the nose. Um, I went to school in Belfast and they all talked like this and I was up in the nose and I mean, because it's all up in here. See, so it gets up in here or it gets out up there. And then I go to America and I get in a taxi in New York. All right, buddy, where do you want to go to? And he, he's like chewing on it like it was a four-course meal. I can't understand a word he's saying. So this system isn't just for people whose first language isn't English. It's really good for everyone. Ah, as in car. It's not car or care or care or care. Or care. It's car. Ah, a wide open sound. Ah, wide open mouth, flat tongue. A, pay, pay. A, it's like ah, but the back of the tongue rises slightly, wider, slightly smaller. Ah, a, ah, a. E, 
as in C. Yeah? C, a wider sound, back of the tongue rises a bit more, and it's a whiter, brighter sound. E, R-A-E. See what's happening? The mouth is closing. R-A-E. Then we get to lips rounding. O, as in so. So, O. Now, a lot of people whose first language is in English have a lot of difficulty with O and U. I always know, no matter how well a German person has learnt English, they can be speaking perfect English, and then they say, Oh, yes, Mr. Palmer, I know what you mean. Ah, you're German. Uh, how do you know I'm German? I said, because of the way you said, no, I'm German. A lot of people can't get this open, round O sound. O, no, go, so. And O, like in do. We want O. R-A-E-O-U. Those are the five basic sounds I start with, okay? Now, we're going to um, take some shortcuts this evening. Um, can everybody see this board? Can you all see it over there? Anyone having a problem? Okay. Um, ha, le, lu, ya. Ha, le, lu, ya. That is the hallelujah chorus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Bum, bum. Yes. About 20 years ago, I was, uh, I, I still produce videos and movies and write scripts and books, but I was full time uh, a producer in uh, television, video and things. And a friend of mine said, Hey, could you come and, could you come and talk to our sales team? Because you seem to know all about voice and presentation. So I said, okay. So I walked into this room. There's 200 people in this sales team. And I thought, what am I going to do with them? And I got talking. And then I told them about these important sounds in the English language. And I got them to... They, actually, I made them all stand on their chairs. I didn't get you to do that because, you know... Yeah. Um, I got them standing on their chairs singing Hallelujah. And I thought, this is good. This is fun. And since then, I've been doing it ever since and I've learned more and more about the human voice. In 40 years, the concert hall, opera, West End musicals, television, movies, I learned an awful lot about how the human voice works through using my own voice. And I was also for about 12 years a top voice artist, r recording for It's So Good for Your Hands, and all that kind of thing for commercials. So I learned a lot about the human voice. So all I've done tonight is just share a little bit, a little bit, about the human voice. Going into an important meeting. You're outside the door and you're going into this really important meeting and you're feeling a bit nervous. Then this is what we're going to be dealing with later, but I'll give it to you now. You just decide that you are the owner of the building, you are a prince or a king, you've invited these people in for you to see if you want to work with them. I tell people this, I teach a lot of people um, interview techniques, you know, when they're going for a new job or for a promotion. You go in the room to decide, do I actually want to work for this company? Do I actually want to do this deal with you? Just reverse it. Just reverse it. Presentation is giving something. It's giving a present. Making a present. I am making a present. Presentation. Think about that. It's to do with giving. And one of the things I've been using in the last few minutes is pauses. The pause is such a powerful thing. We talked earlier on this evening, didn't we, about people who talk too fast. Hello, good evening. Um, I'm rather nervous, so I'm, I'm going to get on with this, and I haven't got much time. Don't you love it when people say, I've got to get through a lot of stuff this evening because we haven't got much time. And you think, oh, jeez. Never say that. We, we love watching moving pictures. I do videos all the time. I put up about average of what I do, about one a week. I'm always putting videos up on YouTube. And people get in touch with me for me to help them. And I say, how did you find me? On YouTube. YouTube is, is a huge search engine. 
You know, so everybody wants to get on it, and we want to watch moving pictures. Why do we love movies? Because there's something within the human being that loves story. If we wind the clock back, maybe a thousand years, we in this country lived in trees or caves, you know, and wore furs, and we lived in these little tiny, um, call them villages, I suppose, these little clans, these little tribes, and nobody moved about much. They didn't move outside of the village, the clan, the tribe, which is actually how accents happened. People often say, why is it in a tiny place like Britain, which is so small, there's all these different accents? You know, if you, if you start in Scotland and you go down all the way through Newcastle, and then the next thing you, you know, you're in the, in, the middle, in the middle of the place and they've all got by, and then you go to Liverpool and you like that, and then you go right down to you're in London, and then you know where you're until you're in Carmel, aren't you? You know, well, how does this happen? It happens because people didn't venture outside of their little tribe, their little village. And however the guy in charge spoke, that's how they copied and they spoke. And that's how we ended up with everyone speaking. And that's how on the grander scale of things, we've ended up with all different countries speaking different languages, which makes it very difficult. But we're very lucky here in Britain because people want to speak English. English is very much the language of the internet and of big business. And so, I, for instance, I've got clients in Russia and Turkey, and the only way they can converse is in English. Very interesting, isn't it? That's why English is so important. Go to my website and see some stuff about learning to speak really great English. Okay, so we love story. And there used to be, if you go back a thousand years, a man called the storyteller. This guy probably had one story that lasted a year. And for a year, he travelled around the country, going to each little village, each little tribe, telling his story. Imagine how exciting it was. No books, no television, nothing. And they were, oh, the storyteller's coming, the storyteller coming. Big excitement, light a big fire, all sit round it. And he starts to tell the story. And then he goes away again. They don't see him for a year because he's telling his story all round the country. And we love story. You see, we're in a story. Our story has a beginning that we know we were born. And our story has an end that we do not know when it is coming or what it is. So we are obsessed with story. We're obsessed with our own story. How long is it going to be? How short is it going to be? What's going to happen in our story? And that's reflected in stories. The best presentation is a story. The best presentation is a story. And it has to be constructed like a movie. It has three acts. Doesn't matter what you're presenting. Doesn't matter what it's about. It has a setup, as we say in Hollywood. It has a story. And it has a wrap up, as we say in Hollywood. And anyone who's interested, I can send you notes about this in much detail because I was a screenwriter and have been a screenwriter. And um, I also taught screenwriting. And if you learn screenwriting, you can write a great presentation. Because the first thing you have to do in a presentation, no matter what it's about, no matter who it's to, you've got to grab their attention. You've got to get them to trust you. You've got to have, they've got to have confidence in your presentation. And it must not be boring. I have a lot of people come to me, many of whom are in other banks, and uh, they say, I've got to do a presentation. They show me the presentation. I say, give me a presentation. <coughs> Waste paper basket. Oh, what, are you, what are you doing? Now let's do a presentation. What do you want to say? What do you want the people who listen to your presentation to think? What is the outcome you want? I teach a lot of um, 
people in marketing and sales. And salespeople can't get this. They walk straight in and say, oh, hello, my name's Valentine Palmer and I've got something wonderful. To... Yeah, I mean, you have no idea, but this is going to do something fantastic for your business. I mean, if you use our bit of software, yeah, they're dead. You go in and you set it up. In a movie, when you go to see a movie, it starts with showing you it's this kind of a movie. It's a kid's film, it's a comedy, it's a romance, it's a thriller, it's a horror, whatever it is. And this is who the hero is, and this is who the heroine is, and this is who the villain is. It sets it up, and this is where it's taking place. That's what a movie does. It sets it up. So the whole audience goes, oh, now I know where I am. People need to know where they are in the scheme of things, with your presentation. Then you get into the story. And I got them all singing the Hallelujah Chorus. That's my story. And people are going, wow, this is fantastic. This is really interesting. And then the payoff is, so, if you are concerned about your voice and you now realise that if you want promotion, if you want to get this project made, if you want to get to the top floor, you need a great voice and you need command of it and you take my card and you go to my website and you call me up and say, Valentine, can you help me? That's the outcome I wanted. Uh, uh, how, how am I going to do this? I've just got time to do some slides. I went to a presentation uh, recently and a guy is going to do a presentation. Okay. He stands to one side here. He puts the slides there. And he asks someone to turn the lights off so we can all see the presentation. So the invisible man in the dark, click, click, click. And a voice in the dark speaks what's on the slides. The lovely man. But he used to do these fantastic presentations. Because each slide had one picture a dead cow, a car going over a cliff, and everyone loved it because he's chatting away and it makes sense when he says, this is like a dead cow, I tell you. For instance, guys, is it? of course you could, if you're not careful, you're going to drive over a cliff. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. Think about that. You've got to make your point. Words don't always make the point enough. Now, you want to know, how am I going to put a presentation together? You've got a beginning, a middle, and an end. What you've got to do is to write down your beginning, your story, and your end. Yeah? Then you are going to do 12 or 10 headlines on a page of A4 paper. And each of those headlines is a major thought that leads you into the next thought. And then you're going to just learn thoughts that you wish to convey and put a note of facts and figures that you need there. Then when you make the presentation, you can put that down on a table or a desk or you can put those headlines up on your slide. Just the headline. The first slide comes up, headline. Yeah, I want to tell you about this. This looks like a dead cow, but I tell you why I put a dead cow. Because I want to tell you about old meat. Whatever it is. And you learn those. So that's just very quickly a compacting version, because we haven't got much time and I've got so much to say. Um, that's a compacted version of some of the things that I think you may find helpful in putting together a presentation. And remember the guy who said, I'll be back. Before you go into the presentation, who could you be that had more of something that you'd like to demonstrate, exude, believe in and become.